Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Albie, for inviting me. Um, so this will be a good transition because um, um, Dr. Niedegaard talked about how to take the trash out. I like to talk more about the trash that's being generated because GFAP is mutated in Alexander disease. So um, this is going to be a little bit of a different talk because all of it will be focused on GFAP itself. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what GFAP is and how it works, and um, hopefully many of you have gotten Dr. Messing's book I, on my second reading because even as you know, for me it's interesting to see all the history. Um, I've been studying um, a family of proteins called intermediate filaments for about 10 years, and GFAP happens to be one of these intermediate filament proteins, which I'll abbreviate IF um, throughout the rest of the talk. So intermediate filaments are a large family of proteins. Humans have 71 different genes that encode these proteins, and they are um, they form a part of the cell called the cytoskeleton. So these four images are the same cell. Um, the different structures of the cell, parts of the cytoskeleton have been labeled in different colors. So the red color here is the intermediate filament portion of the cytoskeleton. This is called actin and this is called tubulin. So these two have been extensively studied because we only have a few um, expressed in our bodies and there are not many diseases that are linked to mutations, probably because any mutations would be not tolerated. But for example, many chemotherapeutic drugs work by disrupting the system. Um, on the other hand, because intermediate filaments are so numerous, um, um, the studies on this system have been lagging behind these two, and we also don't have any drugs that can help us understand the function better. So this is one of the major goals of my lab, is to develop small molecule compounds that can break apart this system so we can learn what functions we lose when we break up the filaments, and what functions return when, they, when they're formed. They, they get their name simply because um, the filament size is intermediate between the other two systems. Overall, the cytoskeleton performs many important things. Um, together, these three systems work to help cells divide and move. Um, they give the cell their size and shape. Um, intermediate filaments, in particular, are important for um, kind of organizing the landscape of the cell, keeping small, smaller organelles where they need to be. And they're really important in protecting cells from different types of stress, whether it's mechanical or chemical and so on. So, so there are many of these intermediate filament proteins, but GFAP, as we heard, forms the cytoskeleton of astrocytes specifically. Um, and we know, um, and it has been mentioned already, that during injury, GFAP um, expression is significantly increased and the astrocytes acquire a different morphology. So, um, as I said, GFAP is part of a really large protein family. And the advantage of studying this uh, protein family as a group is that we can um, learn um, things about GFAP by understanding other proteins and vice versa. So um, all nucleated cells, which is essentially all cell types, the, the nucleus is the part of the cell that keeps the genetic material, the DNA, have intermediate filaments that are called lamins. And then the rest of the intermediate filaments are distributed depending on the cell type. So we know in astrocytes we have GFAP. In neurons, there's neurofilaments. Um, the largest part of this family of proteins are called keratins. And so there's um, keratins in the skin, in the hair, nails. Um, and there's keratins in the soft tissues of the body. So most of my work um, up until three years ago was done on keratins in the liver. We still work on the liver. So um, early on when these proteins were first identified, because they're structural, structural and they're very important um, for the mechanical integrity of the cell, it was, it was really assumed that they're kind of rigid. But we know um, from some really nice cell biology imaging experiments that they're quite dynamic. So basically this is a cell where the intermediate filaments have been fluorescently labeled and what you can see is um, these smaller particles. So this is the edge of the cell out here and this is the center of the cell. There are smaller particles that are formed at the edge of the edges of the cell and these kind of converge into these thicker filaments that surround the nucleus where the DNA is. 
As, and you can see this a little bit better if you zoom in on a small portion, you'll see an arrow pointing to a particle that starts out small but then grows into a longer filament. So, so, the, so if you take the example of GFAP, um, one GFAP molecule, when it's made, has to come together with a second molecule, and this is called a dimer. Um, and then two of these dimers have to come together and form what is called a tetramer. So if you think of the tetramer as this laser pointer, and, you, and if I have eight of these tetramers stuck together, like I'm holding them in my hand, that's called a, a unit length filament. A bunch of these unit length filament then string together to form the mature filament. So part of the complexity in studying GFAP is, and, and other intermediate filament proteins is, the, is they have a very complicated um, way of assembling um, and disassembling. And um, while many things are common to the family of proteins, GFAP could have unique attributes that might not necessarily translate to the others. Um, this also makes it a challenging molecule to target with drugs because do we want to target the individual molecules or do we want to target the, the amateur filaments. But this is an important avenue for us in particular because we're very interested in um, how mutations in intermediate filament genes cause disease at a cellular level and what are the points that we can intervene um, because the, these mutations in many cases are causative, targeting the mutant protein is where we want to start before anything else happens. So the first disease, and this is discussed in Dr. Albi Messing's book, um, linked to intermediate filament proteins is called Epidermolysis bullosa simplex, and this was published back in 1991, where um, scientists discovered that mutations in, a, in the GFAP equivalent of skin cells keratins 5 and 14, cause this devastating blistering disease in, in children. So basically, any mild rubbing of the skin will cause rupture and blistering. And so keratins in the skin are a little bit different from GFAP um, in terms of how we understand this disease because this appears to be both um, a um, loss of function, so keratins have to really scaffold the different layers of the skin. So here primarily it's because the, the true function is lost but in the case of GFAP, um, at least based on evidence in, in rodents, it seems like you can live without it, but, but it's bad when there's a lot of it or it's mutated. Um, in addition to skin diseases, there are many chronic liver diseases that are um, where mutations in keratins predispose their patients to end-stage liver disease. So if a person has an underlying liver pr problem, but they also happen to have a mutation in one of these genes, they're more likely to need a liver transplant or die from their disease. So they can cause disease, but they can also be uh, risk factors. And then you, many of you have maybe heard of hutchinson gilford progeria syndrome. This is a premature aging disease that's caused by mutations in the nuclear intermediate filaments. So none of the intermediate filament diseases, there are more than 70 that we know of so far, have cures. Um, but they all have uh, similar mechanisms um, at the cellular level. So um, Rosenthal fibers are accumulations of GFAP and Alexander disease, but there's accumulations of various intermediate filament proteins in these different diseases. And we know that these mutations actually um, strongly affect the dynamics. As I said, filaments are quite dynamic. So these are, um, this is a mutant version of a keratin where you see these aggregates at the cell periphery um, and they're not able to sort of exchange with um, the pool of filaments normally. So I, I worked primarily on um, keratinate in the liver and this is a mutation that's associated with liver disease. So uh, when I was a postdoc I studied um, these protein aggregates called Mallory Dank bodies and you can think of these as the Rosenthal fibers of the liver. Um, these are seen in various chronic liver diseases. Most commonly, patients with alcoholic uh, hepatitis develop them, and um, we don't know what their biological significance is, other, but we do know that they positively correlate with disease progression, and they're independent prognostic markers for developing more severe liver disease. Um, so in addition to keratins, so this is a, an EBS, that blistering disease, Another intermediate filament in muscle called desmin uh, forms these clumps or blobs, however you want to think of them. 
Um, we, call, we call this process aggregation where the protein is accumulating, the cell cannot get rid of it. Uh, peripherin and ALS, bimentin is very similar to GFAP. And another disease that we study called giant axonal neuropathy also has Rosenthal fibers, but also many other aggregates in the uh, cells of these patients because the filaments are not turned over properly. So when I started my lab three and a half years ago, we, um, we wanted to tackle this prob problem of how these aggregates form and what is their significance and what can we do to uh, prevent their formation. Um, we, we have to take a stand and, and make a hypothesis of whether we think they're good or bad or irrelevant and just a sign of the disease. Just based on all the evidence that has accumulated, we think these are um, harmful to the cell, um, um, primarily because intermediate filaments are very abundant. So um, when they accumulate even to a higher threshold than, than their normal abundance and form these aggregates, they can really mess up other cellular processes that um, in low abundance proteins. And the only way we can really know whether they're good or bad is to get rid of them um, and see what happens or to, to reverse the process and make it normal filaments and see what happens. And we're really interested in doing that with um, small molecule drugs. So in order for us to devise a strategy for how we want to do this with drugs, um, this um, recent paper from Dr. Goldman's group was really helpful in kind of helping us think about it because they looked at Rosenthal fiber formation um, and what it looks like in Alexander disease mice of different ages. And the proposed model is that um, early on these, um, so the different color uh, squares here represent um, GFAP or alpha-B crystalline, which, which is like a chaperone that assists with the folding of the protein. So um, as, as has been pointed out this morning, these Rosenthal fibers usually are surrounded by a mesh of normal looking filaments. So one hypothesis is that the normal filaments, and so in astrocytes aside from GFAP, there's vimentin, cinnamon, and nestin, other filaments that are normal, they could scaffold these early, um, early aggregates, um, early clumps. But then over time, as the cell is not able to get rid of um, the protein properly, these clumps grow to a large size and then mess up other processes. So two ways that we can block this potentially using drugs is to prevent the growth of the aggregates. Um, and I'll talk about a process called phosphorylation, which is a modification of GFAP that we can interfere with. Um, or, or start early on and basically take away the scaffolding that may be holding these aggregates together and depolymerize the filaments. And as I said, we don't, currently don't have drugs that can target filaments, so this is what we're trying to do. So um, the way, one potential way to prevent the growth of um, aggregates of Rosenthal fibers is to mess with the phosphorylation of GFAP. And phosphorylation is basically the addition of a phosphate group to a protein. And this is um, a type of so-called post-translational modification. So it's called post-translational because it happens after the protein has been made from its messenger RNA. So you start with a certain set of genes. This is a bit outdated, so maybe there's close to 30,000 genes. Um, but there's millions of proteins, protein versions. And one way to get this protein complexity from one gene, you get multiple different proteins with different functions, is through these post-translational modifications. So. Um, I'm very interested in how the processes that control the addition of these various groups to proteins affect the character of the protein. So as you know, GFAP is 480? 432. 432. 432. 432 amino acids long. All intermediate filaments are around that size. Um, and so the, the 432 is the number of residues in the protein. And as you saw from the different um, diagrams today, patients um, with Alexander disease have a couple of hotspot mutations, so at arginine, the amino acid arginine at position 79 and 239, but there's really mutations found almost the entire length of the protein. And, when, and, and so um, there are, um, in addition to the mutation sites, other amino acids on the protein can get modified normally in the cell with different chemical groups after the protein is made, so this would be a version of so, um, 
uh, amino acids that are not modified, and we know that in the cells, the protein is actually extensively modified, and, and this is how the cells um, work to try to remodel the network. Um, phosphorylation is a really important one be because it's kind of the starting point of all of these other modifications, and if you force this process to happen, you can basically break apart the entire filament network. So, um, as I said, I was working with keratins initially, and we were uh, working to characterize a very highly conserved, so this is um, a site on the protein that's found in basically all intermediate filaments, and typically when that happens, it means it's probably important for its function. Um, so there were reports from sort of large-scale studies is that this tyrosine, so the Y here stands for tyrosine, um, is um, conjugated to a phosphate group, um, but, we, but we show that this process of conjugating this tyrosine to a phosphate is really important for the dynamics, and when you make a mutant of this protein that mimics phosphorylation, so we can't, experimentally we can't really um, add a phosphate group to this with precision, but we can switch it for another amino acid that kind of mimics what phosphorylation would do. So when we did that with keratin, it totally messed up the filaments, and um, we looked at it was conserved across all intermediate filaments, but it's, it happened um, to also be mutated in a single Alexander disease patient. So in this patient, the tyrosine was mutated to an aspartic acid, which we abbreviate with D, and D is that mimic. So, it, so in this patient, um, this patient had a mutation that mimics permanent phosphorylation. And so when wild type WT, abbreviated here, means uh, when we put G normal GFAP into um, cells, this is what it looks like, the green staining. But if we mutated just that one position, we see um, these big aggregates. And so this is kind of my first um, introduction to Alexander disease back in 2013. Um, and when I started my lab, we looked, we, because we wanted to understand the process of aggregation, we looked at all of the intermediate filaments and what was known, and really Albi's group, Albi's effort in this and that of his collaborators um, had the most um, ground to stand on in terms of, okay, if we can show that this process, if we can understand this process, this is the best model system to study it in. <coughs> So also thanks to Albi and talking to him at a meeting two years ago, um, we were able to acquire um, 13 samples from Alexander disease patients that were uh, postmortem tissue that was banked by the Maryland Brain Bank. And um, more than half of these were um, from patients um, who died young of the disease. And um, some of them were patients um, who lived up until 50. Um, and so what my graduate student Rachel did, and Rachel's here, and you can talk to her afterwards if you'd like to, um, she basically extracted GFAP from the brains of these patients, and we did something called mass spectrometry where we fragment the protein, and we look at the modifications, the signature of these different phosphorylation groups. So um, just to sum up the data, what Rachel found was that when we compare normal non-Alexander disease brain for, to Alexander disease brain. Um, there was more phosphorylation on the GFAP from the Alexander disease brain, and this was more, much more prominent in the brain tissue from patients who died young. And this wasn't that surprising because we do know in all of these intermediate filament diseases where there is aggregation, um, there is also increased phosphorylation. But there's lots of different places where the protein can be phosphorylated, and teasing apart, which is the important one, um, is really the, the key. Uh, Rachel noted that, um, so if you think of GFAP as this um, black drawing here, the black um, rectangle is what is called the rod domain, and this is highly conserved across intermediate filaments. The initial line here represents what is called the head domain, and this is a tail. So um, what's interesting in Alexander disease, mutations have been found all through the rod domain, several in the tail, but no mutations in the head domain. The head domain is really important for assembly and disassembly of the network, and it happened that um, most of the patients had this um, phosphor, and this was the most abundant phosphorylation in the head domain of GFAP, so we thought this could be an important um, site to study. And so, we went back to the cell model system and we made 
um, a mutant of the serine um, that mimics permanent phosphorylation. And what you see is um, the, the, the filaments are non-existent. You see these big clumps. And so what this phosphorylation also, what this mutation also did is it, it promoted the cleavage of GFAP into two fragments. So um, from the basic literature, we know that when in Alexander disease, not only do you get aggregation and formation of Rosenthal fibers, but the protein gets chopped up in half. And so we think that phosphorylation in this residue causes the protein to, to be cut, um, and this somehow promotes aggregation. So one question is, is the, the so this cutting, everything takes energy in the cells. So the cut GFAB, you need another protein to come in and actually do the cutting. And previously it was reported that this other protein called caspase 6 could do the job um, in cells. So we, did, we went back to the brain tissue and asked, is this cutting enzyme then present in Alexander disease brain? And how does it compare to controls? So um, I m mostly put this data for the, these data for the, experts because I wanted their feedback, but just to, to give you the, the gist of this, caspase 6 um, it is only expressed in brain tissue from patients who die young of the disease. It's not found in the cortex tissue from patients who die a little bit older. Um, and um, this, is, this is not a developmental thing because we had tissue from patients who, uh, from normal controls uh, who are of different ages and this protein is not present. And it makes sense based on the literature because it should not be there after birth. It's, it's a developmental protein. So this is something that we're interested in pursuing in terms of does this, does the presence of an activation of this pathway contribute to the pathology? Um, but we also wanted to look more upstream. So if, if the cutting of GFAP by caspase is triggered by phosphorylation, is the phosphorylation important in Alexander disease astrocytes? And so um, I'm not going to talk too much about this because Suchan will discuss induced pluripotent stem cells. So taking, pa taking cells from the patients, um, like skin cells, for example, and converting them to astrocytes in a cell culture dish. So we've, we've done two different scenarios where we take um, cells, induce them to pluripotency, and make um, astrocyte-like cells in a dish. And then we also have models where we're trying to grow this, um, they've been called mini brains, and it's not really a, a brain, but it's a cluster of cells that are grown in um, three dimensions. And that's perhaps a little bit better at modeling the, the soft environment of the brain. I don't have any data to show today with that because this takes a long time. So we just cut our first or brain organoids um, last week. And so, so we'll look at those data um, later on, but I'll talk, show you some pictures with, with the other model. So as I said, we wanted to know, we saw this phosphorylation in the brain tissue, but the, does this really have any cell biological relevance? We were lucky because a, an antibody to this site had been generated a few years ago. And so what Rachel found when she stained these Alexander disease IPS astrocytes with antibody to GFAP, this is total, the red, or just the phosphorylated form, she saw um, that the Alexander disease astrocytes had these large mm -hmm. aggregates that sat next to the nucleus. The nucleus is the part that holds the DNA, and it's stained in blue, uh, which is similar to where you find Rosenthal fibers, is they're usually next to the nucleus. But not only that, the nuclei of the cells that had these um, large aggregates looked squished, as if the aggregate itself is causing a mechanical stress and pushing on the nucleus. So we think, we, we had not seen this before using other cell types, so we think this model is pretty powerful to maybe teach us more about mechanisms and, and what, this, what the presence of the Rosenthal fiber aggregates could do to, for example, gene transcription in, in astrocytes. So because it looks like this could be very important, oh, and one thing I also forgot to highlight is that the phosphorylated form of GFAP, as recognized by this specific antibody in green, specifically stained, or more selectively stained, the, the aggregates and not the normal filaments. So we wanted to find out what, is, what triggers this phosphorylation. Um, so you can look at the sequence of the protein. 
can kind of make some predictions about what enzyme could be doing the job just simply based on the sequence. And there's several possibilities, but one that came um, up most frequently this is a kinase called CK2. So kinases are enzymes in the cells that add phosphates to proteins, and there's lots of these kinases. And in fact, kinase is a very important drug target, so more than one-third of all new approved drugs target the, the, these types of proteins because they're dysregulated in cancer and neurodegenerative diseases. And we like kinases because they regulate our favorite proteins, but also in thinking long term, um, if there are inhibitors already being made for cancer and other common diseases, potentially they could be repurposing for rare diseases. So CK2 um, is a two-part molecule um, of what is called a regulatory subunit that brings um, the protein together and a catalytic subunit that basically does the job of adding the phosphate. So when we looked at the patient brains, um, what we saw is that in the young brains, this regulatory subunit that brings the molecule together, um, we saw the signal here that implies that there's some high molecular structure that is being formed um, by this kinase in the young but not the older patient brains. And um, again, when you compare the control, this is not there. So it's selective for the, for the younger form of the disease. And there's also a way to look at overall activity of this kinase uh, by using an antibody. Um, so essentially what this shows is that compared to tissue from older patients, mm -hmm. younger mm -hmm. patients have increased activity of this kinase. So that naturally the next question is, if we block the activity of CK2, can we improve um, the formation of, uh, the, can we improve the function of GFAP? And by function I mean just can we get rid of the aggregates? So. There are a number of inhibitors to CK2, one that is being tested in the clinic for certain types of cancers. Um, but CK2 is a tricky kinase um, to work on because it has many different substrates. Other than GFAP, it could phosphorylate other proteins. Um, and so there's, um, we have to try different inhibitors. One that we tried, um, so this is the three panels here on the left show a control, meaning we only added the solvent of the drug and not the drug itself, um, where you see the accumulation of GF, phosphorylated GFAP into aggregates. Um, and this is in the stem cells that were differentiated to astrocytes. Um, when we added the CK2 inhibitor, we actually can see um, improved processes. So these cells in our hands have a hard time differentiating to become astrocytes, astrocyte-like cells. Um, but when we added the CK2 inhibitor, we, Rachel and I saw more processes that we didn't completely eliminate because some of them still have these aggregates in their processes. So this is a pathway that we're um, interested in following up on. As I mentioned, kinase inhibitors are a very important category of compounds, and this could lead to something called drug repositioning or drug repurposing, um, which has been covered in the news, but basically um, this strategy could take away years and, and millions of dollars from developing a specific therapy because the, the chemical compounds and their safety um, is, for many of them, is known. Um, and um, as I said, we're also trying to discover molecules that directly target the protein rather than working through another pathway. <clears throat> so first I want to acknowledge um, Rachel, my graduate student uh, who's here and who's, who has done all of this work and other members of the lab who helped. I really want to thank Albie um, because without his support this project wouldn't be this far along. Um, financial support from Elisa's Corner and the United Local District Foundation as well as the National Science Foundation and um, all of our collaborators. And I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, so we do have time for questions, but I just want to say we're going to, um, we're obviously running behind schedule, so we're going to decompress the schedule for the rest of the meeting, because I know some people um, have travel plans. So, Marsha has um, uh, graciously offered to videotape her talk, and so we'll put it on uh, the YouTube um, version of this event, along with her email address, so people can write to her with, with questions about it as well. But that'll, just give us plenty of time to get through the rest of the day and end it right now. Are there questions for everyone?
And actually, a lot of this data I haven't seen before. So it's really interesting. Yes? So I have said that I have some basic microbiology background, and I have some So what we, a lot of times, the cutting and the phosphorylation go hand in hand, like phosphorylation has to happen first before you can cut the protein. So we, the way that we think of it now is that CK2 has to phosphorylate GFAP, which then reorganizes itself to, to become a better substrate for the caspase. So it's like an ordered sequence of events. Do you guys all do research so the stem cells that we got um, were from a R239C mutation. That was what was available to us. We would love to make more. This, this, and the surgeon will, <laughs> will also talk about. This is a really expensive procedure. So we've done a lot of work on this one cell um, line, and Rachel has also made um, has spent a lot of effort making it what is called an isogenic control. So from this patient, make turning the mutation into the, what is the normal residue, and then comparing the, the function, and so and the isogenic control would also then be our gold standard for when we screen for drugs. Um, we want ones that convert it back to the, the isogenic control. So that's been our effort, but it, but it would be important to test this in multiple um, um, mutations, and the, the fact that we see these pathways in all of the young patients which have different mutations is encouraging that it might be more general. Yeah. So it's interesting because I think R seventy nine H is also found in type one and type two patients, but some die young and some die older, and so um, that you know could distinct this pathway could distinguish. Type one obviously is the infantile, and you're talking juvenile and adult, or is it more juvenile? So in this set of samples, we had one 13-year-old, and so that would be, I guess, the juvenile. That's and so when Rachel looks at that sample, sometimes it tracks more with the infantile, sometimes it tracks more with the and adult. So it's kind of samples from patients that have passed. Or These are all adult. patients that have passed. Yeah. Um, for the iPS cells, we can do that from living patients. <clears throat> Thank you. Hey, so thank you, Natasha.